Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are and when you're watching this. Uh, welcome to another broadcast from the GG's broadcast pod. Now, this one uh, is a bit different from the others. I asked you last week for your questions uh, and promised you some answers to those questions. I have your questions here and some notes uh, to support my answers. Um, and they cover a, a, a range of subjects, so thank you for that. And um, they, they, they cover a range of um, perspectives as well. And um, I'll cover them all good, good, and not so good. And that's all, all you know, always fair. I, I, I want to answer honestly and candidly um, your questions and try to um, reach out as as I can to your frustrations as well. Um, so with that said, they cover the following areas, race types and betting. We'll start with that. And then we'll go on to um, technology briefly, features, staking and tipsters, um, regulation and a fair bet, and research, betting research. Um, so quite a lot of ground to cover. Um, and I'll be, I'll be uh, chopping and changing between um, the live screen here and um, my desktop. Um, I just need to quickly do something here, which I think I've just done. Okay, good. Uh, right, back, back with you. Okay, good. Um, right, so let's start with race types and betting. <laughs> and the first question is, uh, is um, what might be described as a Bobby Dazzler. Um, it's, it's, the, it's a subject, well, let's read the question. Kevin Clark asks, how do you work out handicaps? Um, given that about 70% of the race program these days are handicaps, um, that's a, that, that is a very big question. And there is no short answer to it, um, th but there are a number of pointers that I can offer. So uh, let's, let's go in a general direction on that basis. Um, first of all, there's a whole uh, breadth of handicap types. Let me just pull up the screen a second here um, and do a bit of shareage. Uh, right. Actually, before I talk about the different handicap types, um, this blog post, which I wrote about four years ago, um, remains as current now as it was then. In fact, since we've gone from 63% to around 70% of races, it's arguably even more current than it ever was. Um, so what I'm going to do is once I've recorded this video, I'm going to make a blog post out of it. And underneath the video box, I'll put the questions and any, um, uh, I'll, I'll put the time in the video that the, the question was answered along with any supporting information. So I will basically put this link here um under the video but if you search handicap plots and blots ggs uh you should find it let's just check that handicap plots and blots ggs uh, there it is so it will come up for you if you do that search um there's information in there around um, this is particularly around sort of uh first time in handicaps and things that might be different. Um, and that's one of the, the issues that you need to consider when you're looking at a handicap. So let's um, let's go to a random handicap today. And I promise you this is a random handicap. Um, let's have a look at this three-year-old plus one. Right, so what we've got here is, um, let me just see if I can look at the, I'm looking for something specific to share with you. Okay, maybe this one. Right. So um, it doesn't really matter about um, the the distance or the class or or um, what which race code it is in terms of the the general question. How do you work out handicaps? Um, you need to be aware of two things in handicaps when you're starting. There are two types of horses in handicaps, and there's a there's a kind of a spectrum from one to the other. Um, so at the at the far end of the handicap, you've got a horse like, um, let's say, Singular Quest. 
let's have a look at Singular Quest in this race. So Singular Quest is a six-year-old and he's had 22 races. Um, and in handicaps, let's just press that handicap button. He's had 15 runs in handicaps uh, without winning. That's not entirely relevant. Um, the key point here is that this horse is what we would say is exposed um, or at least relatively exposed. That is to say he's he's already had loads of races. So we're probably not expecting him to make a massive leap forward unless there's a material change today. Um, now, there is a material change today. He's got this TC icon here, which means trainer change. Let me just make this a bit bigger. Um, so you can see that there, trainer change. And if I just click on um, the jock, the trainer form, I beg your pardon, you can see this is Kevin Frost. You can see Kevin Frost's record um, with with horses that he's acquired from other yards. And it's it's not terrible, but it's not fantastic either. He's a low strike rate trainer anyway, as you can see from these all and all handicap lines here. Um, but first run for the yard, not not a brilliant record now of course that doesn't mean he's not going to win today but um what i'm trying to highlight is that this horse singular quest who is a seven to one chance so is fairly high up in the market um he's had a lot of goes already and there's nothing particularly significant about him today nothing different about him today apart from the fact that he's trained changed trainers now if frost if the trainer frost had a great record um with with horses he'd acquired from other yards then you might say right well that's a material difference but it doesn't look like he does so on balance i'm not expecting this guy to do anything um that he hasn't done before and what he's done before is failed to win in 22 starts so that's one end of the spectrum is the exposed horse and in a race like this you'll have a bunch of in most handicaps, you'll have a bunch of horses who bring an exposed level of form to the table. Now, a singular quest, as you can see, has got plenty of green on the place. So he's he's knocking on the door, um, but without without uh, breaking it down. As you can see, he's none from eight on the all-weather, none from five in class six, none from six in this sort of field size. Um, he's a frustrating type. Now, he'll have his day one day, but... That's not his form chance is not really the purpose of this. What I'm trying to articulate is that he is a horse um, that is not that is probably not capable of significant improvement. Now, let's just look at this guy here, Ness of Brodgar. Now, he's a 33 to one shot. And again, I don't get hung up on, on the, the form chance. It's just the, the, the profile of the horse. He's got a full line of gray uh, zeros which is to say he's never run on the all weather in a handicap. Sorry, this is this on handicap uh, only. He's never run on the all weather in a handicap. He's never run in a class six handicap. He's never run in a Lingfield handicap. He's never run over a mile and a half in a handicap. And he's never run in this field size in a handicap. So everything he's got scope to improve or regress against all of today's race conditions. In other words, he's a wild card. Um, so we might look at his form a little bit and we can see that this is a mile and a half race um, and he got handicapped up to nine furlongs. Wasn't beaten far uh, on the all weather in the middle run, beaten five lengths there. And then um, on his first run for 10 months, in other words, he's missed the entire summer um, for whatever reason. Now, he might have been injured or he might have just been being saved for the all weather. <clears throat> um, he ran 15th of 15. Now you can see he's had two turf runs. He finished last of nine, beaten 20 lengths, and last of 15, beaten 50 lengths. Um, and he's had two all-weather runs where he's run, in in the Lingfield case, much better, and in the Wolverhampton case, slightly better. Now again, this is an all-weather race, um, and it could be that on his just his second start in a handicap, uh off a mark of 62 he's got a bit of a chance now he's one of these where 
it's a naught to 60. So really, he's carrying two pounds above the, the ceiling threshold, which is quite interesting. And if we just look at the trainer form, we can see a couple of lines down at the bottom here. We've got second start in a handicap, um, 5.88% and 23.5%. Now compare those with the overall statistics for this trainer, who is another low strike rate trainer, and they're they're not too bad. Um, again, I, I'm not trying to make a case to bet this horse. Uh, what I'm trying to say, and we can see that he actually ran in um, this race where, in, in fairness, he was beaten out of sight, but the, the race has worked out pretty well. There have been four winners from 10 starters in the race since. Um, so it, he's he's probably not completely without a chance. The, the The key here is that he is unexposed. He's only had a few goes. And he's only had one go since February of this year. So he's entitled to step forward for that run. He gets the first time tongue tie, which is another difference. There are a few things about him that are different today. So getting back to the question, how do you work out handicaps? You need to think about two things. You need to think about the horses in the race that are what they are, essentially, and work out your hierarchy, maybe your top two or three based on uh, established form and the way the race might be run today. Um, so there we'd be looking at probably not draw over a mile and a half, but certainly pace. We'd have a look at that. And we can see that this singular quest is going to be probably ridden prominently. He's got stalled too, so he's probably going to be close to the front, um, ridden to have every chance, and then we expect something to go by him most likely. Um, Nessa Brodgar will be in the ruck, and if he's good enough, um maybe he will step forward now interestingly he's um second highest on the speed ratings as well although again i'm not trying to make a case for this horse i'm just making the case that he's unexposed and although he may look like he's got no form <laughs> and he may turn out to have no ability at all but um there are a few things different about the race today. It's his second start off a layoff. He's stepping up from a mile and a quarter to a mile and a half in terms of all weather. He's stepping up even more. Um, the trainer has a, a fair record um, with a second time in a handicap. He's got the tongue tie on for the first time and so on and so on. Um, so those are the things you need to consider. And then you say, right, well, he's 33 to one. If he was eight to one now you if he was eight to one you might be more attracted to him because you might think okay well then th this feels like a bit of a this feels like the cup final today this might be the race the fact that he's 33 to one sort of implies that maybe he hasn't got any ability um but you don't have to invest much to essentially buy a ticket in the ness of brodgar raffle or a horse with a similar profile um and that's so those are those are two things that you need to to be thinking about um essentially you need to be thinking about horses with exposed form and therefore back class that is to say that for instance pivotal flame here um has won two out of six in the in this grade uh and two out of eight at the track and he um if you look at his recent form um you perhaps wouldn't be that excited by it but he's dropped down two classes that's what this means he's got first time visor he's going for a trainer in form and he's got this back class he's historically he's done reasonably well over these he, he's a winner and in this race are a lot of non-winners um so he, he's in the exposed camp he'd be more attractive to me than singular quest he's more attractive to the market than singular quest so that, that you've got those at the one end of the spectrum and then, then at the other end of the spectrum you have to kind of project a little bit about horses like ness of brodgar who have got very little form in the book and could be capable of stepping forward markedly um now there are other race types let's see if we can find a nursery handicap now in this it's quite late in the season now, so quite a few of these are um, um, pretty well established. But you've got horses in a race like this that sort it by market rank. You, the second favourite has only had four runs, and you, you've got to kind of – there are a lot more horses in these kind of races that are unexposed. Um, in other words, we have to project 
as we were doing with Ness of Brodgar. We have to project how much they might step forward and for what reasons. It could be that the trainer um, is adept at placing them well first or second time in a handicap. It could be that they're stepping up in distance. It could be that they're stepping down in class. It could be that there's um, <clears throat> equipment on or off. It could be a jockey change. Um, it could be a whole raft of things. It could be um, a, a pointer in the breeding related to a step up or down in trip. These are the things that we need to consider when we're working out handicaps. Now, of course, you don't have to have a bet in a handicap, right? And and actually, you don't have to have a bet. It's a pretty good going in position to say, I'm not going to have a bet today unless something convinces me to have a bet. In fact, one could argue that that, it, that should be the standard going in position. Today is a no bet day. That should be your going in position. And then you need to be convinced by the case or the profile of a horse now on any given day today is a wednesday in december and you know that even on a wednesday in december there are five race meetings one two three four five six seven five sevens are 35 plus two extras even on a day like today there are 37 races to choose from right we can't unless you've unless you've got all day to look at this you can't look at all those races so even if you're only looking at the handicaps just click the filter button there you still got 6 12 17 24 you still got 24 races to look at now you might um you might then further differentiate by you say you only want all weather handicaps um you've got a load there or you only want um national hunt handicaps then you've got seven to look at or you might differentiate on class or distance um what i would encourage you to do is to differentiate somehow is to give yourself less races to look at um and uh, almost to the point where it's if you if you want to improve your betting and your handicap betting it's almost worth saying right I'm going to pick one race today and whatever amount of time you've got, whether it's 20 minutes or an hour and a half or whatever, spend all of your time or most of your time on one race. Get down and dirty, get to know the runners, look at the profiles, really get stuck into a single race and take your time to understand um, the vagaries and the patterns in in the form the, in the historical performances of those runners um i would recommend you do that on races where the level of form is well established and i would recommend you do it on races where you've got say between eight and 11 runners i think or 11 or 12 runners something like that and generally handicaps um so and I would normally, personally, I'd normally look at either a national hunt handicap or a sprint handicap. So I might be quite interested in this good handicap at Kempton, for instance. Six furlongs, um, eight runners, pretty well established level of form for most of the runners. And we can, you know, and there's one here, there's a couple of three year olds. One's a trainer change, TC. The other's a first time handicapper. And we could really get, we could really get stuck into a race like that we've got horses like tropics who is 10 and atletico is six um and the seven-year-olds polybius and el jadaf we've got we've got some really established performers and then we've got these less exposed horses like mokatil and danzan who have who, who maybe have to step forward a little bit um but they've got less miles on the clock so their their um their progression curve has um offers more hope that they can step forward today um so th that would be a good sort of training race if you like to have a look at ultimately you have to make a value judgment it's not just about the form uh, particularly in in sprint handicap so we'd be looking at the draw here um and um the pace as well so if i just make that seven to eight runners actual draw position and, and and you know we get the usual um all weather sprint round a turn low draws are favored um it's not such a glaring bias 
um, at Kempton, six furlong in these small fields. Although the ones hung, hung out widest, you know, they still struggle. And the ones on the inside, they have a very high place strike rate, as you can see here. Um, so then we'd overlay pace on that and we'd say, right, sort by draw. And we can see that um, the horse most likely to lead is it drawn in trap one, which is Danzan. And we can see that leaders at this track have a, a good solid record. Um, and we can see that Dan Zan is having his first run in a handicap, uh, which may or may not be a positive from the bolding yard. Uh, certainly not a huge negative. He, you know, plenty of them win, um, although not necessarily profitable to follow. So we've got it kind of got an in around Dan Zan. But as I say, the, the point is to is to um to have a good look across the whole field and consider not just form factors, not just established form via instant expert or full form, but the scope to step forward and um, the the horse's prospects um, in the context of the race with pace and draw and trainer form and all the other factors. Um, and if that sounds like a lot of things to do, that's because if you want to take it seriously, it is and because you shouldn't be trying to do this on every race just concentrate on maybe sprint handicaps maybe um three mile chases uh maybe you know whatever whatever interests you um concentrate on those kind of races the races that i never look at because i haven't really got a, a, a proper foothold on them are early season nursery handicaps and three-year-old handicaps pretty much at any time. In other words, where I'm expect where pretty much any horse in the field can step forward. I like these races, a race like this, where most of them have got a fairly established level of form. And there might be a couple of lurkers like the three-year-olds in here. But generally speaking, I'm dealing with what I know um, rather than those three-year-old handicaps where I'm dealing with a lot of things that I don't know. I hope that makes sense and i hope that gives you something on which to hang your hat kevin um, and others in terms of how you work out handicaps okay uh let's go if i can switch back to the screen there we are all right so that um a lot of the questions have shorter answers than that i'm sure you'll be relieved to discover um but that that one with 70% of the race program being handicaps, um, that really is a very important uh, question to cover off. So happy to spend a, a bit of extra time on that one. Now, John Ainsley writes, my question is I am not sure what I'm looking for in looking for winners. I use Instant Expert first to sort out horses that fit the greens. This is the dog's. Then I look at pace to see if the selection has the credentials. Then I go to draw if on the flat and look at that. Then I pretty much lose the plot. What do you look for after this? Thanks. Love the videos. Learn so much. Um, John, you don't necessarily have to look for anything after that. I think you're, I think you're doing it right. And if there isn't a horse that's saying, at the price, this looks very an interesting play based on form profile, based on pace and draw, uh, potentially based on trainer form as well, um, and perhaps recent form, recent horse form. Um, if nothing is screaming to you, it looks like a value bet. There's probably not a bet in the race. Don't, I'm gonna I'm gonna be returning to this point over and over again. Don't try to find a bet if there isn't one. You shouldn't be losing the plot. You're doing it right, John. You shouldn't be losing the plot. You should be saying, right, okay, I've looked at I've looked at these factors, and having looked at them, I'm still kind of if you if you've got a ten horse race and that hasn't narrowed it down to two or three past the race it's too competitive there are too many chances unless you know if you've got it down to four and one of them's and, and they're all, you know largely equivalent chances and one of them's 12 or 14 to one you might take a flyer um but generally speaking if you've done that good work and you still haven't got a pretty short short list it's a no bet race 
don't bet go to another race move on you're doing it right john and um that there, there are there are few things more um uh disillusioning than putting in the hard yards doing the analysis correctly and then making a bad betting decision okay and there are two things here there's the there's the form study if you want to call it that and there's the betting approach if you've done the form study right and you make bad betting decisions that's where you are if you do the form study right and you have discipline and you make good betting decisions that's where you are so it's really really important to not force it if there isn't a bet there there isn't a bet there okay there's on a day like today how many races did we say there were um five lots of seven uh, 37 races today right now if you even if you are only looking at two or three um you probably find one race that you can narrow down to two or three horses and you might choose the wrong one you might dutch your stake across all three you you know there might there might be no bet across the three races that's fine it's absolutely fine if you really need to have a bet on any given day and to be honest i typically like to have a bet on any given day then have a small bet have an action bet know that you make it you you did you did the work but today is not a day to press up on your uh, on your endeavors on your labors okay and in those cases just have a small bet because you'll be you kick yourself probably if one of your shortlist or the one you like most goes and wins but at the same time you'll kick yourself more if you didn't have a stronger if you ended up not having a strong opinion on the race but you wagered as though you did have a strong opinion that's not good and that at the end of the on any given day we can have a good day or a bad day but at the end of the year the difference between being in front and being behind and the difference between being a good better and being a bad better as opposed to a good student of form um is these decisions that we have to make if you go through a race and the and and you can't narrow it down to two or three contenders having done all the good stuff that you've done there john or anybody else um pass that race move on we need to move on to the next uh question this is from simon boardman i am a massive place pot nut me too uh any advice on this type of bet with regards to gold would be much appreciated also, what do you think of Colossus bets, which now offer this bet, and any advice on the cash out option? Okay, um, lots to uh, lots to consider here. First of all, there is a blog post that I wrote on uh, PlacePot, and I think if you Google or Bing or whatever search engine you use, how to win the PlacePot, um, there is a GG's article that comes up which I wrote, gosh, eight years ago now. Um, the place has been around for like a gazillion years, and you can't actually see this. So let me um, quickly do a screen share. Uh, share. Um, yeah, so this is this is the, um, if you do the Google or Bing search, it comes up at the top there somewhere, hopefully. And if you click on that, then you get this article about the place pot. Um, and there's various information on there. Um, about some kind of quite cute stuff as well as the simple stuff um on top of that right let me just um go back to looking at me sorry about that on top of that there are some things to think about so um what you shouldn't do is two by two by two by two by two through the card um that how to win the place pot um post talks about abc x which is a staking approach um i think although that's fairly advanced it's um it's a very useful way to weight your bet towards your stronger fancies um because one of the things that people often do is they put the favorite and a 12 to 1 shot in a race and and if you if you do two in that race um, one of them is a favourite, the other is a twelve to one shot. What you're basically saying is, I have the same level of confidence 
that either of these horses will be placed in this in that race now that might be the case but generally speaking if one's two to one and the other one's 12 to one you probably don't have the same level of confidence and you should bet in a way that reflects that confidence differential um so that's something to think about there's a tool which might be on that page let me just check whether it's on that page uh it's not 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 is it um no it's not so i will link to that i have a, a tool that will help you to weight um your bet now that does mean that you've got to um, essentially write out or tick the boxes depending on which you know whether you do it in the betting shop or online um, multiple times for multiple tickets but you will have a much more um you'll have a much more uh a much better weighted um investment so that's the first thing um second thing is you've got to you've got to go you've got, got to know when to go narrow and when to go deep um and one of the things that i am often guilty of is trying to get a strong favorite beaten now if you get one of these things beaten it's great because it takes out a massive chunk of the market but um we've got to consider the probability of that actually happening so hoping or wanting that horse to be out of the frame is not enough of a reason to go five deep against it um and and sometimes i can be guilty of of uh over aspiring in that regard um conversely if you have a competitive handicap you might find that the top three in the market carry a disproportionate uh, amount of the wagering money in the pool so it's worth going deep there um if you have a, a race where the top two look very strong um then just go too deep and um, don't try and push that. What else have I got on my notes here? Um, always consider how you can ensure a bet. Now, what I mean by that is if you've got, for instance, if you've got a novice hurdle with, let's say, 12 runners and the favorite is even money, um, it's probably about one to five or one to six to lay for a place on Betfair. So you can bank on that race, regardless of where it is in the sequence, and you can cover your stake for a very small outlay. So if you if you staked 60 quid, um, you could lay the favorite, you could lay that runner for a place for a liability of 10 quid. So that then means that you obviously you've invested 70, but you are guaranteed one way or another to get through that leg. Um, you either either your place pot goes down and you get your money back from laying the horse for a place or your place pot moves on to the next leg and you all of your um, all of your lines on the place pot are intact because you banked on that particular horse um, if there's a short price favorite in leg six bank on it unless you really don't like it in which case spread out a bit but if you if you bank on the shorty in leg six um you can get a projection of what the dividend is likely to pay and you can lay for a place um to kind of um to guarantee yourself a return essentially so that's another thing if you have a five horse race put the first two in the betting uh, this is leg six stuff again if you've got a five horse race put the first two in the betting or maybe even the first three um and you can play the others in combination exactors uh, to ensure your bet that way. So there are a few things to think about in terms of insurance. With regards to Colossus, I'm a big fan, and I'm a big fan for a number of reasons. Firstly, I can do syndicates, which means I can do a 100-quid ticket, take 50% of the ticket, um, and only invest 50 quid, and other people can chip in bits and pieces. Um, my style is, is I'm tending to look for bigger dividends, which means that when they're small dividends we don't get our money back and that's you know if that's not your style fair enough but um if you if you do like chasing rainbows a little bit then um some of those syndicates might be fun for you um the cash out option is not really something that that appeals to me 
and I've been burnt as a consequence of that uh, recently a few times. But nevertheless, you know, I think that's just a an unfortunate run. And I hold, I think, you 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 essentially pay a premium to cash out. So they're going to cash out at maybe ten or fifteen percent less than the mathematical. Um, than the algorithmic value of the ticket at that time. Um, so always know that on the one hand, no one ever went skint taking a profit. On the other hand, you are taking less than market value if you cash out, not just on Colossus, but on any bookmaker's cash out option, you are being offered um, you're being offered below market value. Now, if you don't like the horse that you've got left in the run up or if you've lived a charmed life to get that far then you might want to take out take the cash out or at least partial cash out that's fine um but just be aware that um it's it locks in a profit but it's not necessarily a good deal okay that's enough on that one next question um jerry martin says i wonder if you could come up with a good query tool to be able to lay a short priced horse successfully. I do lay, I'm down money and I need to turn things around. Um, laying is difficult. Being a bookmaker is difficult, but being a layer on Betfair where you have to, um, where you have to lay at high, higher odds than the, the off course, sorry, the on course market, um, mm -hmm is very difficult now of course you haven't got their expenses so it kind of works out similarly nevertheless um i think there's uh, i think there remains a a falseness a false perception that um laying horses is somehow easier than backing horses um you will certainly or almost certainly have a higher strike rate if you lay horses but your your losses when a horse you've laid wins will quickly er eradicate or erase uh, your profits from when those horses lose it's a difficult game and it's one of the key things about it is you've got to have a very strong mindset you've got to be equipped with a betting bank and discipline um, it's a much more rigorous game than backing uh, and if you haven't got that, if, you, if you're not that kind of person, it's probably not for you. Um, that isn't really the question you asked. So um, in answer to your question, I, I, I don't lay shorties, not very often anyway. Um, my general approach would be, I think, um, even if you're right quite often, if you're laying horses at about even money, you're still going to get whacked 40 percent of the time that means you're right 60 percent of the time which even money gives you a nice profit but on any given run you could go five or seven um you could get five or seven wrong in a row which is very painful and you again you've got to be geared up you've got to have a bank to accommodate that right it's not an easy game um but i'd be looking for hype horses i'd be looking for horses where the favorite is short uh, on the basis of chat um, in a race which is more competitive than the market makes out. The Fighting Fifth the other day was a great example. Sam Crow was was sent off six to five in the end. Um, a novice, a second season hurdler who'd got beaten by um, probably a, a championship rather than Premier League horse last time out, um, running against a jewel uh champion hurdle winner in Bouverdere. Now Bouverdere may have been not quite cherry ripe for the occasion. Sam Crow obviously would have well not obviously but presumably would have been expected to be um more at concert pitch having had that that um opening run of the season. Nevertheless one of them is operating at a Champions League level and the other one has has looked very impressive in novice company and is now, has, you know, has got something to prove stepping up to the championship level. So obviously that's an, a convenient example, but there are cases every day where um, a trainer, a trainer's reputation or a jockey's reputation um, 
shortens the price of a horse whose form credentials are not so superior to his rivals um, or who who has only as much progression or perceived as having only as much progression as a number of others in the race. Um, the other type to look for in terms of exposed levels of form are horses that are doing something different today. So big step up in trip, uh, different ground, uh, a race course which can be a bit quirky or stiff fences for a dodgy jumper or whatever. Those are the things to look for. Again, I'm not a layer and I wouldn't, each to their own, but I wouldn't necessarily encourage um, newbies or even intermediates to get too heavily involved in laying um, short priced horses in the win market. I think it's a, a pretty difficult game. Okay, let's move on. Um, uh, oh, Murray Samuel says, uh, I enjoy reading your articles. My question is what feature in GG's you would use and how would you use it to find small priced lays, if that's possible, right? So a lot of what I've just said applies. In terms of what specifically I'd use in GG's, I would start, let me just do a quick screen, screeny share. I would start with a report called the A to Z report, which uh, as the name suggests, lists all runners on the day. And as you can see on the right-hand side, it's got the odds and you can sort uh, by any column that you would like. So I would sort by odds. And then I've got my shorties. And then I'd go and look at these races um, on the bases of what I just talked about in terms of uh, conditions or uh, potential um, reputation. So for example, Mr. Whipped in this race, is a hendo horse um i mean that obviously that gives it you know hendo is a high strike rate trainer um but this horse is four to six and we need to go and consider those things in the context of the race see what he's up against and so on um so but i'd go to the a to z report to get this list and then i can conveniently click on that time there and i can go um i hope to the racing question here we are um and I can see what he's up against. So have I got any, <clears throat> it's a novice chase. Have I got any reservations about his jumping? I, is the pace, could he be inconvenienced by the pace? Uh, and so on and so forth. Your decision based on that. But there is no, um, there's not really any formulaic way to, um, consistently find short priced lays i think that's enough on short priced lays let's move on keith blundell or blundell apologies if i got that wrong um says would you kindly expand on the relative values of pace in chase hurdles and national hunt flat i'd find that very helpful um okay so um let's start with national hunt flat most national hunt flat races let me um let me go back to my screeny again Apologies for chopping and changing here, but I think it's more helpful to um, to illustrate things. Let's have a look at today's racing. We set that right. So we've got um, here's a big field national hunt flat, and so we'll look at this one first. Um, what we can see here is there's 16 runners, and only three of them. Well, that was run once. In fact, let's just press this button here. Uh, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So out of sixteen runners, they've collectively run under rules twelve times. Unsurprisingly, the pace tab looks like this. Um, and if we put it on the data view. It looks even more sparse. So essentially, the, w one of the things about National Hunt Flat Race is that they are notoriously bereft of pace very, very often. Um, trying to work out what's going to happen from a pace perspective is akin to the proverbial jelly nailing exercise. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't encourage anybody to bet on the basis of pace or perceived pace 
in nas- national hunt flat races they are um th- th- they are very difficult to fathom um at the other end of the spectrum and let me just see if i can find this from a google search uh we have chases and particularly handicap chases and this is an article that dave renham wrote in september on ggs um it's a really good article and it basically says that front runners are favored and they're favored significantly more at some tracks than others so again i'll link to this i very much encourage you to look at that as a general rule of thumb it's not actually just speed handicap chases uh three mile chases um uh, fav- basically most handicap chases favor um pace or early pace to some degree or other hurdle races are a little bit less predictable from a pace perspective um you, you obviously have individual race setups where a horse is favored or unfavored by um a given a given pace setup but in the main they are less um that they're less predictable than than chases handy i'm always talking about handicaps here or pretty much always talking about handicaps um so i i I'd, I'd still be interested in pace i'd be interested in pace in any race so i'd still be interested in pace in um hurdle races uh, and what the setup looks likely to be but i'd probably place less store in it as an overall determinant of where i want to bet than i would in a handicap chase or in a sprint race on the flat um, or potentially depending on uh, the shape of the race in a in a longer distance race on the flat so i hope that helps there um ah james trench asks what do you do to improve your strike rate well the short and i guess slightly flippant answer is back shorter priced horses um there is no escaping the fact that if the the longer your average odds the lower your strike rate if you bet horses at one to three um even if you're pretty bad at betting horses at one to three your strike rate is still going to be about um 60 60 something percent you're going to back more winners than losers um you're just probably not going to make a profit if your average odds are 10 to 1 and you're very good at it your strike rate is still only going to be about 10 percent or 9 percent um so obviously you're going to go much longer between drinks uh it's going to be feast and famine and you have to have the mindset to be able to deal with that so you need to know based on your betting style based on the average price that you wager at you need to be comfortable um, both mentally and financially to accommodate the, the 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 losing runs which are a mathematical certainty you cannot bet a hundred percent winners even at one to ten you cannot do that it's impossible right one day something's going to happen and if you're all in every time you're going to get wiped out you can chip away chip away at big prices but you've got to have the mindset to deal with the extensive famines um, from a wagering perspective that will um, th- that are certain to uh, blight you if that's your style. So how do you improve your strike rate? Well, um, the short answer is to, to bet shorter priced horses. But you need to do that. You don't have to bet shorter priced horses. You can also... Um, eliminate more losers and that is just a process of making better decisions about when to bet and when to pass um, which is something i've covered already and i'd encourage you uh, i'd encourage everyone to be um, as selective as you want to be but understand the difference between when you're betting because you have a strong opinion or when you're betting because you just want to have a bet both are fine but know the difference and wager accordingly okay next question uh steve sparks says i would like to see more guidance on how you as an expert would go about picking a selection or two maybe a guided bet for a saturday or big meetings um 
that's quite interesting because Saturdays and big meetings, uh, not not so much the big meetings, although certainly some of them, but Saturdays, I find very, very difficult betting days and they're probably my lowest betting turnover days of the week. The reason is it's too competitive. There are too many horses with chances. They're all trying and they're all, it's, it's really, really difficult to find winners. Now, of course, um, the prices reflect that. So if you do manage to land on a winner, you probably get paid eight or 12 to one as opposed to four or six to one in the week. But that's because it's a much more competitive race. Um, having said all that, I can definitely do more to um, to show you how I use the tools. And I'm conscious that there's a piece still missing around bringing it all together. Um, I'd like to, rather than do a single um, episode, if you like, on that, I'd like to do a more regular thing when time allows uh, and showcase different tools in different race setups. Um, having said in the first part of this recording about spending half an hour on a single race and really getting to know the horses, um, that's something that I will look to demonstrate in a future in a future recording. Um, but yes, certainly I would do more of that kind of focus focus on individual races and show you um, the sort of things that I would look at in that context. Okay, next question. You see, Aaron or Oren um, says breeding and sales data snippets. There's a number after Stallion's name, like 6.7 furlongs. What does that figure mean? Okay, um, as I understand it, this is this is data that um, we don't calculate this. We take it as is from our supplier, who is the Racing Post. Um, and as I understand it, that number is the average wind distance of progeny of that Stallion. So uh, that's that. Um, also, what is your personal opinion about a very big break between runs, like over 200 days. I mean, in the betting perspective, is it better to leave those kinds of horses without a bet? Um, it, it depends. Um, these days, the the um, training habits, training techniques have improved markedly um, in the last 10 or 15 years. And um, uh, horses, a, a bigger layoff is, is not necessarily um, an inconvenience. Now, it kind of depends why the horse has been off the track. And and the answer to your question is, there isn't there isn't a set answer. I don't have a specific feeling about horses that have been off the track for six months or whatever. Um, if a horse has been off the track because of an injury, then uh, you'd kind of, I might want to see, again, it's price dependent, but I might want to see um, some evidence that the same horse has returned to the track as the one that I last saw a year ago or whatever. Um, so that's one thing, but that's only if you know there's been an injury. More typically, if you've got horses making their seasonal return, so there's no there's no um, ulterior reason for them having been off the track for a period of time. It was simply because it was the summer and it was flat racing and they were jump horse and they're coming back in November. Then I'd be looking at the trainer, um, how the trainer does with layoff horses. I'd be looking at um, whether the market spoke favorably about a horse's chance, which would be a, a clue as to its fitness. Um, I'd be looking at a jockey booking potentially. I'd be looking if the horse has been running for a number of seasons, I'd look at how it did on its first start of the season historically. Um, a whole range of things, but it, but it's all contextual and specific to either the sorry the, to either the trainer and or the horse, depending on how much horse forms available. So that's that. Um, couple more on race types and betting. Right, this is a long one. Okay. Hi Matt, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I didn't notice the bringing it all together section on your last web. Thingy. Okay, so I've said about that. I'll admit to still struggling a bit with gold as there is so much to look at. And whilst I feel like I understand all of the individual components of full form, pace, draw and the reports, I'm still really struggling to know which ones to give the most weight or credence to and which ones to ignore, as obviously they're all pointing at different horses. If you could show how to sit down and tack a race, cold um, or starting points, I think that would help. Um, 
okay so i kind of i touched on this already again and it's 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 this it's the situation where um if you if you are using those components and they're not generally leaning towards um two or three horses in the race it's not a race to bet in it's it's a pass race it's a or an action bet race an interest race it's it, you've got to you've got to when you when you're using the tools um they need to be sending you they need to be filtering the runners so if a, if, if we start if the top of my fingers is all of the runners in the race by the time you've used the um the instant expert and the pace and the trainer form and looked at the contextual snippets if you are not down to a small subset that could fit between my wrists here then it's a pass race because the, it's too competitive there are still too many horses with a chance and this is one of the problems with saturday races right we all get hung up on these ego ego trips are oh, back the winner of the portland handicap are back the winner of the stewards cup fantastic but you only got paid 12 to 1 you can bet 12 to 1 any day of the week on a horse that probably should be 7 to 1 or 6 to 1 um You've got to choose your spots. You've got to choose your battles. You've got to go into battle when the odds are in your favour. There's a reason why the Portland Handicap and the Stewards Cup and all those other ones are sponsored by bookmakers because they're freaking impossible. They're supposed to be really difficult. They're not my kind of bet. I mean, you know, I'll have an action action bet or an interest bet because I I'm as interested in watching those. They're a fantastic spectacle, aren't they? And if you do find the winner, they pay well, but <clears throat> again it's this whole thing about um you've got to choose your battles and you've got to you've got to get involved when you can turn the dial slightly in your favor when the odds are slightly in your favor if you can get six to one about a five to one chance that's good if you're betting in the stewards cup you're generally getting six to one about an eight to one chance the odds are against you you're generally generally up against it not always you know there are, there are ex exceptions to everything but typically um if you're do if if you're already this was ian mcdougall by the way ian if you're already pulling those things together and you're not your your um your shortlist hasn't condensed to a small number of horses it's not a race to be playing in and i suspect part of this is that you're you're starting with the most competitive races on a day. Um, I like races. I like eight to 12 runner handicaps where whilst I, I fully acknowledge that any horse can win any race. I like those races where um, four or five of them probably uh, they can win, but their chance is probably overstated by the market, which means that for the remaining runners in the race, their chance may be slightly understated by the market. Now, of course, the market is going to get that right more often than I am, but I only need to get it right often enough to um, to turn a profit. So I'm looking for races that are prob that I perceive are less competitive than the market suggests, and I'm choosing my spots very carefully within those. Um, I will do more on this, and I will, you know, kind of go through a card and say, right, too competitive interesting really interesting way too competitive and so on and we can hopefully you'll get a feel for the sort of things that i'm looking for when i'm looking to discount races on the basis that they're essentially too hard um so that's that um uh, there's another bit here right I, i'm probably in the mode of not being able to see the wood for the trees almost too much information and not knowing how best to use it I'm guilty. I'm probably also guilty of looking for big price winners rather than just winners. Um, then this guy who is uh, Lee goes on to say, I'm looking for nice steady returns and a bit of fun along the way. Now that there, there is, the, there's a problem here. Um, and the problem is if you're looking for big price winners, that's not a problem per se, but if you're looking for nice steady returns from big priced winners, that's going to be a problem, right? We already know that um, the longer the odds, the lower the strike rate, 
the longer the odds, the longer the losing runs you're going to incur. If you're betting even at eight to one, you could easily have a 60 runner losing rate, losing run um, during a year, right? Now, that would be, you know, at the thick end of, of what might happen, but it could happen. And if, if you're not geared up for that, then you're going, you, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. If you don't understand the maths of the situation, the fundamental maths, right? The form book is irrelevant. If you don't get the maths, the maths are that if you're betting big priced horses, you're going to have stinky losing runs. If you can't cope with that, look, narrow your focus, look for horses, in, at, you know, in a lower price range, maybe five, five to one to eight to one. Now, I'm not I'm not suggesting that you should look at five to one to eight to one. But if you're looking for Hail Marys all the time, you need to know they don't come along very often um, on any given day. There will be a couple of 16 to 1, 20 to 1 winners. But that's from maybe 100 horses priced at that price point. And if you feel um, adroit or adept enough at discounting most of the horses at that price point and finding the winners, if you can look at those winners retrospectively and make a case for them, then maybe, you know, maybe you're you're on the right track. But generally speaking, the maths of the situation are that if you're looking for big price winners, you're going to have stinky losing runs. It's you can't get away from that. So those two things are kind of mutually, almost mutually exclusive. Um, I'll be very careful with that. But again, you know, we can have fun with this and we can have action bets and we can um, make more uh, more heavily staked investments at at um uh, shorter prices potentially and and it's all about it's all about the the price and value proposition it's all about the the odds being offered and what we perceive the chance to be um clearly that's a subjective matter clearly it's an experiential thing to some degree it's you know kind of uh, a lot of people do tissues uh, i do it by feel um, I think the thing with tissues is that actually there's quite a lot of feel that goes into creating the numbers in the first place. So it's still feel, it's just a bit more structured and formalized. Um, some people do it algorithmically. Some people do it, uh, you know, using computer software or whatever. You end up in the same place, which is this horse is six to one. I think it should be four to one um, as an example. And then it's a bet. Even if you're right that it's four to one, you're going to be wrong uh, 80% of the time, right? But you're going to get paid out uh, as though you would be right more, uh, less of the time, more of the time. I think you know what I mean anyway. <laughs> um, basically, if you, can, if, you, if you make a horse X price and you can get a better price, if you can get um, higher odds, then that's a bet. And it's just a matter of over time how good a judge you are of that. Okay, so that's enough on on um, that particular topic. That was the longest one, which is race types and betting. Now, one question on technology very quickly. Um, can you see yourself developing a GG's mobile app in the future? That's from Roy Nickel. Uh, I've heard a few people asking me that on Twitter as well. The short answer is probably not. Um, and the reason for that is because we at GG's unashamedly pack a lot of information into our views. Now, generally, we compartmentalize it. We stick it behind icons. So you only see stuff if you click stuff. But it tends to fill the, the width of the page, and it can go quite far down as well. So trying to squash that into a, a, um, a, a, a an iPhone viewport, as an example, is quite a difficult challenge. Um, the alternative is to remove some of the information and only publish a subset. I'm really loath to do that for a couple of reasons. Firstly, um, I just don't like the concept of dumbing down. I think some things, excuse me, some things don't lend themselves to a mobile device and form study is one of them, in my opinion. Um, I've yet to see a decent horse racing mobile app and I've looked at a lot, all of the major media houses i mean to be honest most of them their their desktop 
um, provision is not fantastic, but their mobile provision is is it's not going to help you back winners. Let's say that. Um, so that's the first one. The second one. What was my second point? Um, can't remember. Doesn't matter. It's it's generally a no to um, a mobile app, certainly at this stage, just because of space constraints and dumbing down the um, the process. So let's move on. Um, features, feature requests. Okay, awesome. Could we have a first time headgear report and query tool? Yes. Um, there is a first time headgear by trainer report, which we should have uh, in the first part of next year. Um, we already have it on query tool in dev. Um, so we've got we've got um, equipment uh, as a as a variable. Let me just quickly show you this. Um, share. OK, hide. So um, where are we? Tools, query tool. So we already have a um, an equipment headgear parameter here. So for instance, if I type in Pong, Pong um, all of the various combinations with tongue tie, including just tongue tie, um, appear. And I can do uh, search search stuff on that. Um, but we don't have a, a headgear or equipment count like we do wind count. But we have got that on our dev, and we're testing it. There are a few bugs in it at the moment, which is why it's not on live. Um, but we will be – so we, we will have that soon. And we'll have a report as well, which just shows um, – we probably won't use those combination headgear. But we'll, the way I'm thinking is it will be – a bit like the trainer snippets, it'll be a two-year report, um, and it'll be trainer formed by first-time tongue tie, first-time visor, first-time blinkers, first-time hood, so on. Um, and we might put wind up on there as well. Uh, I'm not sure about that at this stage. So that that's coming, and hopefully will be with us this side of the Cheltenham Festival. But we have got a big piece of work that we're doing at the moment, um, so uh, just I just need to be careful about making any kind of promises around that. Uh, next request, is it possible to add to the race card a going filter to see if any of the red-green figures are changed? I presume that means on Instant Expert. And the form figures can relate to such an update. Instant Expert does show most of this, but not if the trainer's or jockey's record without having to use a full form screen. Right, I'm not 100%. Not this is Terry Scott asking this, by the way. I'm not 100% sure. Um, that I'm understanding the question correctly, but I'm just going to show a couple of things. So the first thing is that if we're on the uh, on the race card page, um, let's say that it was a there was a lot of rain at Haydock, and the going was now heavy. What we so what we've got before we do that is we've got this. Handicap hurdle, and if we go to Instant Expert, um, the going is it's giving us the data based on good to soft. And if we go to full form and we click the going filter, it will give us this good to soft here. You can see it in the race form at the bottom, hopefully. GS there. So if we go back to our race card menu and we change that going to be heavy. And then we go to the same race and we go to instant expert. The going is now filtered against heavy. So these are performances against heavy. And if we go to full form, we've got our going clicked here. And again, uh, wait a minute, what's happened there? Looks like a bit of a glitch. Going, right, there we are. Not sure what happened there. I had to refresh it. Anyway, under the going, we've got this heavy here. And we can see the horses run twice uh, and it's finished second and eighth. Now, I just want to, might need to refresh that. Uh, yep. Oh, I see. Okay. So this is because I've got filters on here. So if I put everything on all, all codes right now we can see that zero from two which is the same as um 
uh, the zero from two here. And if we put it on the place, <clears throat> we should see one from two, I hope. Uh, and there we do, one from two there. So that's that. So um, you can um, you can change the going on the race card menu page, and it will it will reflect through the instant expert in full form. Now, if you want to look at going for a trainer or a jockey, you will need to use the full form for that. Um, I I'm not a hundred percent convinced I've answered your question, Terry, but I hope I have. Um, next question, Tom Flat says. Why does the contextual breeding data and trainer data, etc., update so late in the day before the race? Before I used Gigi's, I used to pick my horses at around 11 o'clock um, the day before and then place the bets in the evening. My mornings and evenings are busy, so this worked best for me. I understand that you obviously won't change the way you do things just for me, but is it possible for this data to be uploaded earlier in the day? The answer is no, it's not possible, um, I'm afraid. <laughs> and uh, that's not just me being awkward. We receive our data from the Racing Post at specific points in the day, um, and the breeding and sales information comes in in the evening file. So we actually don't get that information until somewhere between five and seven o'clock, depending on the time of year. Um, so there's absolutely nothing we can do about that. The second part, the trainer data. Now we do have a view, not the contextual snippets, but the 14 day, 30 day and so on. We do have a view of that um, throughout the day before, but it's, not going to be current because obviously if a run, if a, if a trainer like Nicky Henderson today, if he's got four runners today, they won't be reflected in what you're looking at if you're looking at it the racing a day in advance, whereas they'll be updated overnight um, and you'll be able to see tomorrow, i.e. on the, the day of the races that you want to look at, uh, the most current version. So <clears throat> that's a verbose way of saying there are there are um, very real constraints that we're up against in terms of providing what you ask for, and there's not not a lot we can do about that, I'm afraid. Um, next question, Eddie Curtilus asks, would it be possible to add in a horse's current official rating onto full form? Just that when you're looking at its past ratings, you need to go back to the race card to see its current OR. Yes. Definitely. We'll get that in soon. Um, it really should be there. Thank you for asking. We will make that happen very soon. Um, Michael Manning asks, hi, guys, can I check the previous high low prices of horses in play? That is, if a particular horse is generally shortened in running. Uh, not at this stage, Michael. We don't have Betfair or exchange data, um, but it's certainly something that I would like to introduce. Um, got a couple of options to make that happen. So probably not in the first half of next year just because of other priorities but um by the end of next year i'd be surprised if we haven't got some sort of some sort of in running uh data provision so like i say not anytime soon but yes i think that's coming okay let's move on to staking and tipsters um and david harman uh says i am really disappointed with stat of the day i'm a yearly subscriber it's very difficult to get best odds guaranteed without being gubbed however i do like you and your apparent honesty that's why i joined but this service stat of the day leaves a lot to be desired and i have lost a lot of money as i understand stat of the day is found using your stats so why what does it say for using your stats i hope this does not come across as a knee-jerk reaction it's been a long time coming. You asked for comments, so here, here am I. Um, that's a very fair question, David. It's perf perfectly reasonable. If you joined Gigi's Gold um, solely as a tipping service, then you are entitled to feel disappointed with the performance of Stat of the Day in the recent past. Now, Stat of the Day has been running since 2011. Um, to this point, it's not had a losing year, uh, and most of its years have been in the 60 to 80 point profit range. Not spectacular, but it's a one a day service and it chips away very nicely. This year has been very, very difficult. 
not just for Gigi's and Saturday of the day, but for uh, a whole raft of um, very good tipster services have struggled this year. Now, um, we haven't changed anything about the way that we do Saturday of the day. Um, it's, we did have a very good end to last year and um, a very good start to this year, in fact, and, uh, and a, a fairly serious correction was probably overdue. Um, you need to keep in mind that with a one a day service that doesn't do Sundays, we're looking at about 300 picks a year. We're not looking at 3000 picks a year, you know, still quite a small sample size. Um, so these, these, these runs do happen. Obviously they test the metal of people who follow tipping services. And um, obviously we would, obviously we would have liked to have had a much more positive bottom line to talk about um i can't promise that it will change in the immediate future because i'm not clairvoyant but we have our history is is over seven years um and it's a very strong history and i'm sure that um that at some point we will turn what's been a bad run around now i want to say a couple of other things which are not specific to start of the day um well, one of them is, and the other one is is more general. Firstly, if you subscribe to Gigi's Gold solely as a tipping service, that's entirely up to you, but I think you're missing out because I think there's, well, I don't think, I know there's so much more to Gigi's Gold than stat of the day. Um, it won't necessarily suit everybody's individual tastes, and David, it might not be for you to, to look at form study yourself. So that's fair enough. You have to judge the service on the way you use it. And if you only use stat of the day and you've only been involved for, let's say, the last six months, I can understand. I can very well understand why you'd be disappointed and, and frustrated. Um, I hope you'll stick with us. I further hope that you'll um, have a sniff around at a few other parts of the site and find things that might be of interest and empower you to um, to make your own picks as well as following stat of the day. That's up to you. The other thing to say about stat of the day is that every single day chris puts information in his post that you could that one could take away and deploy in their betting more generally for example if he talks about a trainer's record in all weather handicaps that might be something that you want to keep in mind you might save that as a query tool angle and get notified on the race card when that particular trainer is running a horse in an all-weather handicap or a sprint all-weather handicap or with a, a filly or a mare or whatever it is. Every single day, there is educational information. There is content in those posts that can move your betting forwards if you want to let it. Um, again, at the end of the day, if you just want to back the horse, then that's fine. And, and you know, you, you, you can only judge it on that and it is what it is. But I think there's so much more depth to stat of the day than than just um, uh, a selection each day. However, I do respect that some people, you know, for, for some people, Gigi's gold is one pick a day, Monday to Saturday. And if that's you, then it, you're right. It's been a very difficult run. And I hope that we break that soon. Um, I think that's enough to say on there. Um, Joe Duran says, do you have a forum or group chat where you and other members send out their selections for the day? Yes, Joe, we do. Um, and I'll quickly show you where it is. Uh, it's in the menu. Up top, Just bear with, right here, this guy. And if you click latest forum posts, you will see the latest forum posts. And you can see that there's various, um, there's all, all sorts of bits and pieces in there about um, different things. You can see some threads are shorter, some threads are longer. Um, and um, it's definitely worth a look if you're a gold subscriber. This is for gold subscribers only. So if you just hover over forum, you can click the latest forum post, you'll get that. Okay, so that's that one. Um, what have we got next? David Edmonds, I follow three or four tipsters. All have long-term profitable records. However, often they will tip different horses in the same race. What strategy should I adopt? Cover all, split stake or not, and therefore reduce overall retu return? Or if they tip the same horse, should I increase my stake? 
I would use separate banks, but wonder whether better to focus on just one tipster. Um, I think a portfolio, if, if you follow tipsters, I think a portfolio approach is fine. Um, I think in order to do justice to the individual tipsters, it should be a separate bank for each one. Um, if you have tipster A and tipster B tipping a horse, a different horse in the same race, I think you should take whatever stake is recommended from your tipster A bank and back the tipster A recommendation and whatever stake is represent, re recommended in your tipster B bank and back the tipster B selection. Um, if they suggest the same horse, I think you should bet the same horse multiple times against your um, your ring fenced individual banks and, and against the staking that the, the tipster has followed. If you choose to follow tipsters, you should follow tipsters. This um, it's very, to me, it's a very um, um, kind of clinical way of doing things. It's almost like following a system. You do it blindly, unquestioningly, and almost unthinkingly. Um, but you're quite right, um, uh, David, that you should you should set up to succeed, and that means having separate banks, and it means following the staking advice given by the individuals and treating them as separate siloed um, selection pools. Uh, I hope that uh, there's not really anything else I can add there except no, nothing else I can add there. So that's that. Uh, next one. What have we got? Thomas says, for many years, oh, this is a good question, actually. For many years, I believe that doubles and trebles, etc., were a mugs game and always stuck to win only successfully until I read somewhere that if you knew what you were doing with your selections, they could be lucrative to do in multiples. So I brought this into my betting, and so far I found this to be true. What's your opinion on this? Right, it's a really good question. Um, and I think it depends how you go about things. If you do lucky 15s, uh, lucky 63s, lucky 31s, and so on, those bets I don't think are good value bets because if you have a lucky 31 with one loser – out of your five selections, it becomes a lucky 15. So one loser in a lucky 31 equals 16 losing bets. I don't think that's good. Um, if you do doubles or trebles, as in one bet is a double, or maybe even a Trixie or something like that, which is three doubles and a treble, um, and you either have best odds guaranteed available to you or you're a good judge of the market and typically your horses shorten. Um, I think that the, the small multiples approach is a good approach. Now, obviously, a double comes in a lot less often than a single uh, because you've got to get both parts right. But if you can back two horses at three to one, let's say, and they both go off at two to one, you're getting four times, you're getting 15 to one about what is an eight to one chance. So you're essentially getting double. Um, and if you were betting those two as singles, you bet two, two, to, two, three to one singles compared with two, two to one singles. Bear with me. You'd get, you'd make a profit of six points from the three to ones as opposed to a profit of four points with, with the two to ones. So the difference betting them singly is about 50%. The difference betting them in a double is about 100%. Now, it depends on your hit rate and so on, but um, the answer to your question, Thomas, is yes. I think if you if you do um, if you do doubles and trebles, and, and as I say, you can uh, particularly if you can avail a best odds guaranteed, um, then you've got it's a good approach for sure. Um, I'm not going to labour the example, but if you have best odds guaranteed and those two three to ones drifted out to four to one, you've got a twenty four to one double as opposed to a um, fifteen to one double. So again, you know, you you you're kind of you're pressing up your advantage if you like, but you've got to get two horses right rather than one. If you bet them singles and one of them wins, you make a profit. If only one in the double wins, you make a loss. So those are the things to think about. Um, next question. I believe that you once wrote that raising stakes during a losing run was better than raising them during a winning run. Is my memory right? If not, what are your thoughts on staking? This is from Barry Coe. 
Barry, yes, I, I have I have written that in the past. And it, it, it's based around the fundamental prem, premise that if you are if you're following an approach, um, whether it's a kind of a system or a mechanical approach or a tipster that you believe in, if if you if there's strong history to support um, a contention that after a bad run will follow a good run, then it makes sense to slowly increase stakes after a bad run um, whilst waiting for the good run. Now, you know, nobody knows when the tide will turn. And Stat of the Day is a pretty good example, actually, that where we've, you know, we've kind of had this extended um, difficult period. More recently, it's kind of a hiatus, uh, but pro just a sort of a, a plateau, a flat line. Whereas before we, we'd gone that, we, we went that way. Then we went that way, and now we've gone sort of just just a very small uh, and narrow band of support and resistance for for performance. Um, would I encourage anybody to increase their stakes uh, marginally? Yes, to a small degree, um, and and in any similar context, that might be an approach that you take. Now you still got to have a bank that will support that, and if you look at your bank and say, well, I probably can't sustain increased stakes for any you know extended period of time then maybe it's not an approach you should take but i certainly think it's the case that um if if a if a service or an approach has had a good run after a good run expect a bad run um, and after a bad run expect a good run that is just the nature of of you know bigger sample sizes um which is why uh very often when a when a tipster is having a you know a good time of it back to a few tipped a few big winners you'll hear all about them and then and it's probably not a great time to join a service because you've missed those big winners and if their average betting if their average odds are eight or ten to one you can go a long time between between meals you know it, it can be a long time before the next big winner and you just joining after the big winners <laughs> while you go through that famine period and people wonder why this guy said he had all these winners and now i've joined and they're all losers well it's just the maths of the situation so obviously it's very difficult to market a service saying we've had a terrible run come and join us but there is the logic supports that our brains tell us that this is not a good thing to do but logic if we think about it logically it's a sensible thing to do so now is probably a great time to start following stat of the day because it's had this protracted difficult period um don't quote me on that of course because i uh, you know again i my my i smashed my crystal ball and um i've been really struggling with the future ever since but the logic of the situation holds. We've got a seven-year track record, which is almost, you know, it's obviously it's had ups and downs, yins and yangs, but um, we haven't changed our approach. So I'm, I'm very confident, as confident as I can be, that 2019 will see a reversion to the norm. Um, so, so that's that. We're getting through them now. We've got uh, one page left, so we're most of the way through. Um, when a new service this is from steve shane stephen shane when a new service goes live why do all the tipsters i follow have to blitz it day after day after day it's blooming annoying and nine times out of ten it turns out to be less than useless but i'm at the stage now where i'm just deleting and unsubscribing so you can guess that i've missed some of the ones that actually work could you just tell me are they being paid for mentioning that service which they say they have proofed for infinity years actually my own service is amazing you'll never get any winners but at least i'm up front about it <laughs> uh steven I, I i understand your um your frustration and um um there is some i can see some uh some credence in what you say so here are a few things um there's often a buzz around new services which is essentially created by marketing um so you know the, if a service is for sale, that means the person selling it is a, is at least to some degree a salesperson as well as a tipster, or they might be a tipster with a publisher who is the salesperson. Regardless of how that relationship works, 
there is a selling there is a buyer and seller relationship between the messages you receive and the decision you're asked to make about do you want to buy the product um the next thing in the process so to be very frank yes um generally if you receive an email the sender of the email will receive some kind of a payment if you sign up to the service um Gigi's is no exception to that. So we trial services on our website and very, very occasionally we promote one without trialing it. If we promote without trialing it, it's because I know the tipster and the publisher personally. Um, and we would, we, we have, ne I've been online for, I uh, started Gigi's in 2008. And before that I had nag, nag, nag since 2006. Um, so that's 12 years online now. I have never promoted a service where I didn't either, where we hadn't either trialed it or I'd looked at it myself and looked at the maths or I knew the person selling it or producing the tips or the service um, in 12 years. And I never will. Um, so that's that. Still, some things that I think look good turn out to be less than good. That's a that's my judgment, which is not hundred percent everybody's judgment is occasionally flawed and I'm no different um, I hold my hands up when that's the case but these days almost exclusively we trial stuff on the site for 60 days so whether you use GG's as a reference point for services or another site it's very very important that you trust that you have trust and confidence in what that website or email sender is saying okay if you don't know who they are how can you trust them if you don't have a relationship how can you trust them um gg stuff is done sorry the sun's coming in there um gg stuff is done the the trials are overseen by chris who's our stat of the day guy the emails are sent out by me um i'm a real person as you can see as you know and um we you know we stand by our reviewers who all do it for they don't get paid for it so there's no um you know that they have no vested interest in in saying a service is good when it's not we do everything um completely transparently and legitimately so if you want to know if a service is any good one of the places you can go is to our tips to reviews which you'll find from the menu top menu on our on on any page on our site um <clears throat> Again, the other thing to say here is that bit about uh, if a service has had a great run, the balance of probabilities are that they're due a not so great run. That's just the nature of of selections. So you have to keep that in mind. So you could join a service as a downturn is about to happen. That doesn't make it a bad service. It just makes it a service having a bad run. And it's very important to make that distinction. Um, so that's that. I mean, I think as a general rule i think there is some value in making a in choosing a couple of trusted partners for this kind of thing and that may or may not be gg so it's up to you i'm i'm not saying it should be um i've told you what we do and how we do it and it's up to you whether that makes us a trusted partner or not but on your own based on your own judgment you should choose uh, i think you know two or three reviewers or trial trialers of services and only get involved with something um, if it's been recommended by one of those people. And and it's a good idea to unsubscribe and delete other stuff. Apart from, we all get too much email, right? So don't unsubscribe from Gigi's, of course. That's brilliant stuff. But some of the other ones you might want to um, relinquish. Um, and if you really want to relinquish uh, your subscription to Gigi's, at the bottom of every email we send is an unsubscribe link. So, you know. Thank you very much for being a part of what we do and we we would genuinely be sorry to see you go but that's your choice and we give you that choice in every email we send uh okay i said enough on that one i think right regulation hmm. interesting question this one from ben sparrow around the time of goodwood matt chapman suggested that there were several odd sps who determines the sp is this something the betters forum is concerned about I think most bettors will put up with the occasional horse which wins out of the blue having been well backed. They like the idea of an old fashioned coup landed. The idea that the whole system is skewed against them is a different ball game. Okay. Uh, this is this is a really interesting question. Um 
in case you don't know, I uh, uh, one of the hats I wear is uh, I've been on the Horse Racing Betters Forum since it started in September 2015. Um, and at time of recording, December 2018, I've been the chair of that group since March of this year. Um, we do have some reservations about starting prices, um, which it's a very big issue around the changing nature of betting markets and the influence of exchanges and the volume transacted on exchanges and off course via remote operators like Bet365 as an example. Um, and how potentially easy, how, how little money these days is required to influence the on course market to manage off course liabilities. Um, now that's a different question from the question that or a different answer than the one required by Ben for his question. Now, in that particular case, Matt Chapman, um, who I think, you know, he's a Marmite kind of character. I think he adds a lot of value on balance. Um, and I think he raises some really interesting points um, about market dynamics and, and a number of other things uh, in the run of his business. On this occasion, he was wrong. And the reason he was wrong was because he was referencing boards, betting boards in the betting ring that were not part of the sample. So the sample is a group of bookmakers on course whose prices are used to determine the starting prices which are returned off course. Okay, um, so there's a defined process created and overseen by a body called the Starting Price Regulatory Commission um, who Betters Forum and I personally have had some dealings with um, and we hope to extend those dealings in 2019. We've got some, I think we need to ask about what what comes after starting price now. It's quite a big issue and um, probably needs an in industry-wide focus. So it's, it, it is a big deal and, you know, I, I, I will have some part to play in that, some small part to play in that, probably from a facilitation perspective in the in the early in the early uh, iterations of the discussion later on it's probably going to be for regulators and operators and um, potentially the BHA and others to determine what happens um, but I'm keen from a horse racing betters forum perspective to stimulate the debate because I think there's a growing um, dissatisfaction with the starting price in terms of how it how it can be manipulated it, uh, that's quite a it's quite an emotive term but uh, how it can be engineered let's say that um so that's for future but it, but in this particular case chapman was raising a valid point but he was wrong um because the, the bookmakers that he was showing their prices they weren't in the sample and there is there's a whole chapter and verse on how the sample is um is arrived at uh, basically it's bookmakers that will lay a horse for good money uh and who have standard each way terms um which a lot of on course bookmakers don't have so if they haven't got those standard each way terms they're probably excluded from the sample um right that's that next question uh, comes from John. As I consider the going on the day to be very important, is there a way to get around the lies that most clerks and the BHA are sending out? All the best and thanks for all the help over the years. Um, mm, okay, uh, first of all, uh, li lies is a strong term and, and probably litigious. Um, so um, I, I think we'll we'll step back from that and we'll ask is there a way to assure ourselves that the information is correct? The answer to that question um, is probably no, short of walking the course ourselves and having having enough awareness and experience to to make a judgment. Uh, so, what can we do? Well, we can we can um, we can bring together as many excuse me as many different perspectives as we can find. We should certainly be able to trust the official going from the clerk of the course and the fact that a growing number of people according to our recent betters forum survey have a mistrust or a distrust of the official line um 
says there's a problem, even if it's a problem of perception rather than reality. Those two things these days are very much the same. So we need to address that. We need more and better communication from race courses. We need a more scientific approach to it. Um, the going stick is quite useful, albeit that it's contextual only to a race course and doesn't. So uh, an 8.5 going stick reading at Goodwood will not mean the same thing as an 8.5 going stick reading at Haydock. That's fine as long as we've got a scale for Goodwood and a scale for Haydock and we can we can um, we can consider 8.5 at Goodwood compared with other readings of 8.5, 8.6, 8.4 at Goodwood historically. That will give us a good um, pseudo scientific at least understanding of the going at that track for race courses and clerks of courses to put on the bha site going stick reading going stick not working is unacceptable in my opinion and i have voiced this concern with um the bha through the betters forum and i'm hoping that um, the provision of more and better data relating to going relating to rail movements um and various other things um becomes a part of the race course licensing agreement. Now, it's going to be hard to get from where we are to that point, but um, if you don't ask the questions, if you don't raise the concerns, then these things don't move forward. So we are working on that and we are lobbying for that. Um, <clears throat> it does seem, in this, in this data age, in a sport which is so data rich and could be marketed as you know like Gigi's gold is a, is is a is data Gigi's gold is about racing being a data rich sport and we have people who don't trust the official going from the race course which is a fundamental piece of information for the puzzle of 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 solving a a horse race um in 2018 rising 2019 that is absolutely unacceptable and we have to get to a better place with it. Um, to address your question, John, I think I think before the first race, you have to have some trust in the going, the official going. I think you have to be very mindful of what the weather has done in the last 12 or 24 hours and what it's likely to do before the end of racing. I think you have to listen carefully to jockeys. Don't only listen to the jockey who rode the winner because he may have a very different opinion to the jockey who rode the second, third and fourth. Um, a bit more rose tinted, let's say. Um, you can use times, but if you're doing that early in the race, early in the card, you need to be mindful of uh, factors like wind, speed, and direction. You need to be mindful of the pace in the race. It's it's and the reliability. You know how how exposed the horses are. If it's a two year old maiden, the first race of the day it's very, very difficult to use the time of that race as a barometer for the going because you just don't know enough about those horses. Um, it is a difficult subject and um, we, it's never going to be um, scientifically accurate to the percentage point. But we should be able to get to a degree of confidence, if not certainty, about roughly what the going is. Um, and I hope that the BHA will support race courses or will insist that race courses are a little bit more regimented about the delivery of that information. Okay, soapbox away. Next question. Um, I was told that the sports book at Betfair was covering single bets with a payout up to £500 without having your account closed. Is this really true? If so, what about multiples? Would they stand a higher amount on these? I'm thinking mainly of football bets. By the way, who owns sports book or manages it? Okay. The Betfair Sportsbook is owned by Paddy Power Betfair. Um, they have recently introduced a minimum bet liability or a minimum bet guarantee. Um, so you can bet any horse after 10 a.m., any UK, any horse in a UK or Irish race after 10 a.m. to win £500 in the win only, so not each way. Uh, no best odds guaranteed. So if the horse is 10 to 1, you can have 50 quid on that horse after 10 o'clock and you will not get restricted and they will take that business. That's as I understand it. Um, I don't know about multiples and I don't know about football bets. This is specifically for horse racing win singles. So that's that. 
Um, leading on from that, William Johnston asks, sorry, that was Philip Payne asking that. William Johnston asks, could I ask if you've heard of any bookies who have, been, who have gubbed or restricted accounts offering reasonable bets on class one or two races? Right, okay, yes. Um, again, this is something HBF have been pushing for, and I've personally spoken with um, the likes of Bet Victor and Skybet and Paddy Power Betfair. Um, and I'm happy that all three of those are now offering some provision, particularly in class one and two races. Uh, as well as that, Corals will offer that in their shops, and I think Labrooks as well, maybe. Um, and I'm hoping, I think William Hill do it on the ITV races, uh, both in the shops and online, and I'm hoping that others will follow early next year. So we are getting some progress on this. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to get a voluntary code um, across all certainly remote operators, in other words, online bookmakers, where they um, they will stand a bet to lose five hundred pounds after ten or ten thirty on the day of the race. Um, if you had a situation where you had eight or ten bookmakers who were doing that, any punter uh, of who who bet normally bets tens, twenties, or even fifties is going to get their bet on on any day of the week and that's fine we're not interested in representing those who want to have two grand on a horse at six to one um those guys typically have their ways of getting on anyway horse racing betters form is not really geared up or set up to support that very very small minority of punters we're set up for people who like me and probably like you can't get 10 pound at four to one um with a given bookmaker who might be top price now that that situation is not sustainable, it's not right, and it needs to change. And I'm very happy that a number of bookmakers are supporting that, particularly in the higher class races. Okay, Jeff Wilkes says, I've had my account with Skybet restricted, it, although I don't think I've won much from them. Is this common? As for the stakes I'm using, I cannot imagine I'm much of a threat. I do only bet a small number of bets per year, maybe 70 to 80. Um, as I've said, uh, I'd go back to them and challenge that because certainly after 10 o'clock or might be 11 o'clock with sky but you'd have to check the specific terms and conditions they should be laying you a bet um particularly certainly on the class one and two stuff to a higher degree if they're not i recommend opening an account with somebody like um betfair who will uh, betfair sportsbook who will lay stand their prices to lose 500 quid um after 10 o'clock win only all right um the last session is about research and about uh, query tool and things like that. And uh, the first question is from Paul Ebry. I'd like to be pointed in the right direction regarding using the query tool, please. I'm sure this is a feature I do not use enough due to not understanding it. Um, okay, Paul, what, what I'm going to do in the first instance is I'm going to point you to um, a couple of things on your My Gigi's page. When you log in, you will see show number four in the help and information section, using query tool to find profitable angles. That is a very good video in this context. So do look at that. Also, in the user guide, I'm um, just going to download that quickly here. Now, what did that say there? It said, yeah, that's right. OK. Um, query tool is down here as well just go to this page if i can there is um there's a bunch of information about query tool and how to use it um in the back of the user guide so whichever whichever way if you if you respond better to um to reading to words and pictures then use the user guide if you respond better to um to this kind of video presentation then do have a look at that video on uh on the my Gigi's page it might very well be that having looked at all that stuff you still got questions come to us ask us any specific questions you've got asked after after that but those are two very very good starting points for query tool brian crick uh is the anti-penultimate question and he says Thanks for being so open with your wealth of knowledge. Much appreciated. I'm a systems man. I was just wondering what I should be accepting as a minimum figure for my systems if I want to make it work on a more professional basis. Win percent, ROI, um, AE and or 
Kai test. Um, there's no, there's no specific answer to this. As always, it's a kind of a, a, a relativity thing, and it's. I think with systems, it, one should very much be looking for um, a system that operates at a strike rate that suits your betting style. So if you like, if you like to back, if, if you like to have a winner um, most days or every other day, it's not a good idea to have a bunch of systems which um, highlight horses at average odds of 10 to 1 because you won't get that consistency that you're after. You'll get feast and famine. Um, also, if you haven't got a bank set, if if if, if you have a uh, if you have a system which could have a losing run of fifty, an average odds of you know kind of four to one could do that for you easily enough. And you haven't got a bank set up to accommodate that, you're asking for trouble. Um, in terms of research and um, which numbers you should be looking at strike rate is very much about personal attitude to risk um and you know how well structured you are financially and emotionally to follow a mechanical approach um things like roi uh, kind of follow on from that but in terms of the um the reliability of a system you might have researched things like ae and um the kai square test um are they will help um chi square test is not something we use on ggs uh not this time anyway it basically the bigger the number the better um it kind of indicates that the higher the number the less likely something has happened by chance um actual over expected is a barometer of uh which we do have on ggs and in our query tool is a barometer of um um market significance a number above one being uh, something that um would we would expect uh to be to have a, a value component to it going forwards um we also use impact value which tells you how often something happens um in relation to the superset for example how often a trainer wins with two-year-olds on their first start compared to how often two-year-olds win overall on their first start and again um w i would always look for a positive ae number um and generally i'd want a positive iv number but a positive iv number is less important if you can tolerate um you know kind of fairly extensive losing ones you can have a low strike rate trainer who doesn't win very often with first time two year olds but when they do they pay a you know a solid price and an example might be someone like um johnny portman who knows a good horse when he has one and he most seasons he'll come by a good horse which is um un understated in the market um but typically the best the, the best way to stay on the straight and narrow is to have um, higher AE, an AE notably above one, maybe above 1.25 if possible, um, and an IV also above 1.25 on a meaningful number of runners. That's what I'd be looking for as, um, as a baseline for, um, uh, for that kind of mechanical approach uh two questions left frank robinson wrote would it be possible to redo the query tool record rec recording i get the gist of it but your teaching has a lot to be desired i take you have never taught in a classroom as you have no synchronization whatsoever or lesson plan talk about winging a prayer or as you put it winging it um yeah maybe a little bit harsh frank but uh, but i do take the general point um certainly it's true that i don't have formal teaching uh skills and so you know i do my best to convey um uh information but I, I, it's not you know it's not something that that comes readily or naturally to me so please accept my apologies for that in terms of that particular video now i am i am conscious that um, for whatever reason, 
it's not easy to see where the pointer was on the screen. I don't think that directly relates to my teaching style, but rather that the um, the the video uh, software that I was using has been unhelpful in highlighting the cursor. Um, I've no plan to redo that recording, but I will at some point do another recording where, where I use a piece of software that has a big yellow circle that follows my cursor around. So you'll always be able to see where I'm pointing and clicking. And I th think, or at least I hope, that will add some value. So um, it, although you might be a little bit harsh in the way you've made your point, I think your point is perfectly valid and thank you for sharing that we'll definitely do something to put that right at some point soon um finally make sure make sure ask the question which i think i probably just touched on um i understand ae and iv at least in so much as anything over one is good but if say if ae is say 0.81 and iv is 1.3 does that indicate a negative stat? I'm pre presuming that it does. Uh, yes, generally I'd be, as, as I think I said, um, I'd always put primary focus on AE um, and I'd be looking for a number, depends on the sample size. If I've got, you know, if I've got 500 qualifying runners, I might be happy with 1.1 AE. Um, uh, assuming the 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 impact value the iv was um uh, you know a decent one point something number um anything below one on ae is questionable in terms of its uh future market value um anything below one on iv just means that it might that that group of horses might win less often than um, all horses doing that same thing. So for instance, the two-year-old first time, um, that trainer might win less often with his first time two-year-olds than, than the average for first time two-year-old winners. But if they pay out enough when they win and you're sufficiently comfortable with you know, what might be a, a, a fairly protracted losing run waiting for that to happen, then um, you need not be overly dissuaded by a lower iv um so yeah that's fine that, that i think that's enough so so basically ae always look for a number above one iv it's a bit more um a bit more debatable but typically if you want to stay in the game or if you don't really like losing runs then a number above one there is probably helpful as well okay and that that wraps it up um it's ended up being a pretty long session um as i say i'll um i'll chunk it up and put some details underneath the video to help people find the bit thereafter um if you've been with me for the last two hours well done uh, thank you um i hope there was some utility in it at some point i'm always keen to help people to use ggs in a way that suits them there's never been a one-size-fits-all approach it's always about um, your appetite for risk, your amount of time available, your level of experience, um, your betting approach, whether you're a backer or a layer or an exotics better or whatever. There's, there's so many variables that I can't, I, I can't just deliver one 20 minute piece that speaks to everybody. So um, if I haven't answered your questions or if, if, it, if more questions have been raised as a consequence of this little chat, um, please do let me know and I'll be sure to either reply on email or in a future video. For now though, thank you very much for watching. This has been Matt Bisogno and I wish you a good day.